I'm Peter Dickinson, this is Paul Roy, and this afternoon we're going to uh, begin by talking about how robotic process automation and artificial intelligence will change outsourcing. Before we do that, perhaps just have a little look back over some chronology of game-changing events affecting the field of sourcing over the last 30 years. Now, 30 years ago, we saw the introduction of turnkey solutions like check processing. 20 years ago, we saw the beginning of the wave of data center outsources. Post-2000, we saw an explosion in offshoring. And 10 years ago, we saw the advent of multi-tenant systems, also known as the cloud. And each of those events was transformational in its impact on the technology market. And now we have RPA and artificial intelligence, which has the potential to change not only technology and the way it is utilized, but more importantly, the relationship between us and technology itself. So what I thought, what we're going to do today is to begin by telling you or reminding you what RPA and AI are, because I think there is some confusion and misunderstanding as to what those terms mean. We're then going to consider how are they being used today, what new capabilities will arise out of RPA and AI, and what is the trend for its adoption, and what effect will RPA and AI have on labor requirements? That we all think is going to have a very significant impact. And what is the impact going to be on outsourcing? And lastly, what is the impact on your sourcing contracts and how should you seek to address it? Sorry, just uh... <laughs> go to the... Ah, fantastic. And the next one, brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. So first, what is RPA? Um, RPA software, sorry, get that one, apologies. RPA is the application of technology that enables computer software to partially or fully automate human activities, which are manual, repetitive, and rule-based. And RPA gives the company the ability to map out a business process that is definable, repeatable, and rules-based, and assign a software robot to manage the execution of that process. Now, in terms of automation, RPA is where companies are going to be able to take real advantage in the short term. Paul will come on and talk about AI, and that is very much uh, the future. RPA is also known as macro on steroids, which perhaps captures the, the impact it potentially has. From a business perspective, the benefits of RPA go way beyond simple cost reduction, and they include decreased cycle times because robots don't need to sleep. They can work 24-7. They're flexible. They're scalable. Once a process has been captured, more robots can be instructed to implement it at specific times, and equally, those same robots can be deployed for other tasks when they're not needed on, on the initial task. They can improve accuracy. They can also improve employee morale because the kind of tasks which are suitable for RPA in the main are onerous, less enjoyable ones. And that can release your employees to focus on higher value, more interesting work. And obviously they can capture an enormous amount of data by recording every step, collecting that data, creating an audit train, and potentially helping with regulatory compliance. So there are some common applications of RPA. Uh, it off, essentially, it works at the presentation layer, the user interface of computer systems, and it mimics the human user. RPA is described as non-evasive, and that's because it can sit on top of a company's IT infrastructure, and a company can implement RPA without having to alter its infrastructure or to require fundamental process redesign. RPA depends on structured data, so the data can come from various different systems. Although not all industries and functional areas are ripe for automation, many areas are already demonstrating the positive effects of RPA. Functions such as IT, finance and accounting, contact center, HR, and procurement are all being reinvented through the propagation of automated technologies. To give you a sense of the potential impact of RPA, one major service provider, which is noted for its current focus on automation, claims to be able to deliver to its customers automation of 30% of in-scope tasks performed by humans 
within 90 to 100 day, days of a go live on a particular sourcing transaction, with levels of automation increasing to between 65 and 85 percent over the next eight to nine months. That is an incredible impact. The same provider also claims that automation will enable something like 60% of all tickets which currently require human intervention to be dealt with and resolved without any human intervention whatsoever. So on the slide we've got an illustration of the impact of RPA where a team of 11 bank employees were previously assigned to manually review on a daily basis 2,500 high-risk customer accounts to determine whether or not payments should be processed or returned and that took 11 employees, eight hours to do that task. 20 software robots can now do that task, releasing the employees to do higher value work. A second illustration perhaps is even more persuasive. A construction engineering business producing and sending out 500 invoices per month, many of which needed 100 pages plus of supporting evidence. That took each invoice around five hours to produce at enormous cost. The work was now done by software robots, and it takes 11 minutes per invoice, saving millions of dollars. Okay. So the question now is, what is artificial intelligence? It's oftentimes referred to There we are. Thank you. So the question now is, what is artificial intelligence and how does it compare to robotic process automation? And the, the distinction is sometimes referred to as the difference between robotic process automation and smart process automation. Artificial intelligence is fundamentally different. Robotic process automation is true to its name. It's robotic. It does exactly what it's told to do, very reliably, and it has a great deal of advantages and a lot of power. As Peter says, it can sit on top of systems, mimic human, behavior, human activities. Artificial intelligence is essentially machine learning. It's, it's very sophisticated software, but more importantly, operates on neural networks. And what's very important is when you code um, robotic RPA, you don't code artificial intelligence. Instead, you train it. And it can be, it can automate highly complex tasks, some of which involve some very subjective decisions by identifying patterns. And it does this by capturing information in very different and novel ways, through, through vision recognition, through sound recognition, through looking at unstructured data. And whereas in the case of ro robotic process automation, its reliability centers on the fact that it does precisely what it's told to do, and it's very agile. It can be made, it can be programmed sometimes by users, but it does exactly what it's supposed to do. So if you change its environment, if you change one side of the system, the structure of the data, you may be breaking the process that the, that the RPA system works in. Not so with artificial intelligence. Because with artificial intelligence, it actually is designed to adapt to changes in environment. That's its, 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 its strength. It works with very complex data. And when it encounters a problem it didn't encounter before, it actually learns for that problem. So the ad adaptability of our artificial intelligence makes it very different. So let's take a look at what I said. It gathers data from in a very raw form, and then it converts that data into a very useful form of data. Let's look at the ways it gathers the, um, no, back up one slide. Yeah, so the, the mechanisms are vision recognition, software that recognizes um, faces, there's sound recognition, there's working with unstructured data, and then there's recognizing patterns of human behavior. One example of vision recognition, you recall in 2013, I'm sure, the tragedy in Boston at the Boston Marathon when there was this bomb and they had to identify who the suspects were. Well, it turns out that there were actually hundreds of hours of videotape from various sources, both cameras, people with phones, um, uh, cameras in front of stores, uh, television cameras. It would have taken humans many, potentially hundreds of hours to scan all that and to identify the little points in that data that would have disclosed who the suspects were. It was actually Israeli software system, artificial intelligence, 
that the Israelis had been using for security purpose that was used to scan that video and identify the two brothers who were the prime suspects very quickly in time for them to be captured. One that you can try yourself, it's kind of entertaining, it's called how-old.net. You can actually use it on your phone, don't do it now. <laughs> um, but you, you can look at that and take a picture of yourself or somebody else maybe, and it comes back from a large, enormous database to tell you how old you compare, how, you, how old you appear compared to its database. A little bit of a clue on this one, don't do it first thing in the morning after you've been out late the night before having drinks because it, it will tell you more closely how old you feel than how old you are. <laughs> Sound recognition, very old. I mean, this is one where we know from Dragon Rider that's, that sound can be transcribed into words data, which can be then processed. But another example I just heard last Friday, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, last, last Friday on a NPR, was these field researchers were trying to identify the number of red-legged frogs in the southwest swamps because they're nearing extinction. The way to do that would be researchers going in the field with wading boots at night, with cameras, trying to listen and identify them. Instead, working with this Palo Alto firm, what they did is set up microphones in these various swamps. And the microphones using big data analysis and artificial intelligence could filter through all the crickets and the other frogs and the birds and all those sound at night to identify the sound of this red-legged frog and thereby accurately count the number of red-legged frogs in the various swamps, eliminating the need for researchers and doubtlessly doing it a lot more accurately. So let's go to the next one. The issue, then what happens is it takes this data and through natural language rec recognition, finds meaning in the data. I think a couple of years ago, I, I mentioned in a program where Google, by the way, one of the prime, uh, a firm that does enormous amounts with artificial intelligence, Google and Amazon, was found in a case to be scanning all of the Gmail emails that users were running through the system to identify their characteristics of what would be good marketing things to market to them. And that was all done by this artificial intelligence capability, converting the data of the converted, of, of a natural language interpretation into, into um, data, meaningful data they could use. The prediction capability you've also heard of in terms of, like for example, Amazon. Well, there was a report that Amazon was actually getting so sophisticated in their ability to, in their deep, uh, uh, big data analysis and their artificial intelligence to identify and predict people's desires to purchase things, that they were considering actually sending, th when they got to a certain high level of confidence, they would actually send products to users before they ever ordered them, trusting they will have either ordered them by the time it gets there or by the time or they'll want it anyway. Um, so that's the degree of, of capability. Now the third characteristic of artificial intelligence um, is one that it's not just identifying correlation, but identifying causation. And for present, well, this is a powerful, potentially powerful tool, but at the moment it doesn't really have a lot of meaning or, or uh, function in business. So Peter, let's go to the next one. Now I said this is machine learning. What the heck does that mean, right? We live in a deterministic world where we code, we put in, al we put in scripts, we put in, al we talk about algorithms for big data analysis. Well, in fact, that's not exactly how it works. Say, for example, you want to teach a neural network to recognize a cat. You don't tell it to look for ears, whiskers, nose of a certain size, a furry animal with a tail. Instead, you show it thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures of cats. And if after a while, it starts to classify foxes as cats, you don't correct the code you simply coach it. And Demi Hassabas, which is who is the leader of Google's um, DeepMind AI team, characterizes the skill as not so much of engineering, but it's more of an art form as to how you do this. And he said there's only about a couple, there's only a few hundred people in the world, in his view, who are capable of doing this. An important fact to consider as your firm moves in the direction of wanting to utilize AI, using Watson's cloud capabilities, for example, are you gonna get the resources you need to enable you to effectively use 
AI. Now, doubtlessly, um, one of my uh, client's sons is going into, into AI and studying AI and artificial intelligence and robotics in schools. So there will be a crop of new people. Let's hope your son can do this in four years real soon. You'll have a lot of work. Um, the other aspect of this is that the, engineer, the engineers don't fully understand how the neural, neural networks accomplish what they do. There isn't code. It's kind of analogous to trying to cut someone's head open and looking at their brain to understand how the brain works. It's, it's very opaque. In a sense, it's sort of a black box. Now, from a contract standpoint, as you're looking to use AI, the question, you have to ask the question, what happens at the end of my service contract? Do we think in terms of porting code, porting scripts, porting logic? But if there is no code or script or logic, it's just this black box. What do you do? And it's something certainly you have to anticipate. Next. We thought we'd talk briefly about some of the products which are already available uh, in the market. And IPsoft, Rage Frameworks in the US, and Blue Prism in the UK have already established uh, platforms which are in use. In relation to the IPsoft product, I don't think I can do any better than to read what they themselves describe its product Amelia is capable of doing. It can digest an oil well centrifugal pump manual in 31 seconds and give instructions for repairs and do the job of a call-out center operator, a mortgage or insurance agent, even a medical assistant with virtually no human help. Fluent in 21 languages, Amelia understands implied, not just stated meanings, and improves performance by hearing humans deal with questions it can't yet answer. Astonishing stuff. Uh, Atos has also been busy using RPA to automate IT tasks for its customers' legacy systems, dealing with things like uh, incident management, server load balancing, and tickets. In addition, there's Oracle's Policy Automation Cloud Service, um, which is uh, a software that can read business rules and policies written in natural language, and then based on those rules and policies, decide what questions to ask customers to perform eligibility, eligibility checks and to produce a decision report, i.e. activities that humans would ordinarily do. And probably as a lawyer, this is the most terrifying. Ross is touted by its provider as the world's first artificially intelligent lawyer built on IBM's Watson and designed to understand language, postulate hypotheses when asked questions, research, and then generate responses along with references and citations. I don't think most of us can even do that ourselves, but it is pretty impressive stuff. So what, as, as our colleague Brad Peterson commented, what would it be like negotiating opposite this uh, machine that could probably remember everything that was said in every uh, comment on every draft? But, uh, and be a powerful ally. Indeed. So one of the things we've observed is that the availability of RPA and AI actually has a potential for opening up new capabilities. It's not just replacing what people do, but actually creating opportunities that don't currently exist. Now, um, Raj Day said this morning that people are always the weakest link in security. So there are a lot of opportunities to use RPA to eliminate part of that, the weakest link, an opportunity for improving security. So if a robot does precisely what it's supposed to, a software robot does precisely what it's supposed to do in transcribing information or extracting information for other purposes, you eliminate the, um, you eliminate the possibility of inappropriate data collection. It's got a precise record of what it's done. You remove the human factor from access to systems that might cause fraud. So you've got a lot of sensitive areas where you are not going to eliminate the security problem because certainly there's an external security problem, but, you're going, but you could be eliminating the weak link of the human factor with highly sensitive data. We're talking about pension data, data about government um, military personnel. And in the bank setting, where you have the potential for an individual having access to multiple bank systems, you increase the possibility of fraud. If you eliminate that, at least in part, or reduce it or minimize it by having software robots perform functions that human would otherwise uh, perform, you help uh, reduce those, those openings for fraud on at least the human side. The other potential avenue for um, RPA in particular 
is really to promote self-service. A big part of the problem with self-service is the technological problem. The systems aren't designed to take the interaction directly from another system and instead relies on transcription from an email, for example, to a system. RPA has the possibility of, since it can mimic human behavior of perhaps combining it with uh, um, uh, natural language recognition from an AI system, but also has the possibility of providing that back-end transcription, increasing the possibility of self-service systems using existing legacy systems. Next. So the other opportunity is to improve, there are five. So the third opportunity is the opportunity for promoting the use of big data analysis. A lot of issues arise in big data in that the data is not in consistent formats or in the same systems, right? People are talking about building data warehouse, enormous expenses going to building data warehouses, data lakes. Well, with RPA, you've got the possibility of extracting that information using robots from different systems without ever having to build that data warehouse and pull, pulling that information in a converted format that's native to that system in a common in a common framework that can be accessible for big data analysis. The other part, and I think this is related to the self-service, is you have the possibility now for collecting this new, Brad, Brad described this and, and, and uh, Joe described that there's a whole a category of things that can be used, legacy system with cloud systems. Now you've got the possibility of using a cloud system and connecting that cloud system um, say, for example, a customer ordering a product or services and connecting that cloud system to a legacy system that actually fulfills the order or does the provisioning using the software robot to connect the two. The, the, um, the, final, the fifth and final point is that because RPA and AI are geographically agnostic, you can use them anywhere, you now suddenly open the possibility of outsourcing or having service providers handle services for you that you could not have previously sent offshore because now you've got the ability, um, given its ge geographic neutrality, of having the system operate onshore and still reduce the cost uh, without the need to turn into labor arbitrage by going overseas. The, now we want to talk about what What's the trend in RPA and AI? And Peter referred to some statistics, but of all the research we've done, we believe that RPA and AI are still at the very early phases. One estimate is that RPA right now can only automate in a range of 20 to 40 percent of the functions, but that's going to increase rapidly. The pace of adoption, we believe, is, is very fast. We are, for everything we've heard about it, for all the examples I've given you, it's really not immersed or uh, it's not embedded in most companies. And uh, CIO, I think it was CIO Magazine, right? CIO Journal article cited, cited a statistic from 2013, why they went back as opposed to now. It was a recent article, I don't know. But they said the number in 2013, the reliable number, is about $183 million spent on this. And that the, num the amount they expect to be spent on this in 2020 is in excess of $5 billion, around $5 billion. Um, NASCOM, the Association for Indian Outsource Offshore and Providers, which is obviously one that would be thinking in favor of the offshore providers, along with uh, another uh, advisor did a, did a study and they found that the compound annual growth of adoption for RPA alone is over 100% per year. So if you take that $183 million and multiply it times two and the result times two, you actually get to $5.18 billion by 2018. I don't think we're going to be there, but what the, the principle that I'm trying to convey is it's a hockey stick, stick type of growth. And where are we now? We think we're still either in the blade or at the very early part of the handle, and it's going to accelerate very fast. That's why we think this is very relevant for you to start thinking about now, because it's coming quickly and you have to be prepared. Um, the estimate um, proposed by, in terms of cost savings, you've heard Peter refer to it, is that the Robotics Process Automation Association estimates you can save, you can reduce your cost by about 50% 
again, sort of a self-interested um, uh, estimate. But if you look at the estimates proposed by NASCOM in a recent study, they came up with a range. They said they distinguished between onshore and offshore. And they said the onshore cost savings is between 35% and 65%. The midpoint is exactly 50%. Same thing as the, as the Robotics Association. They said the cost savings for offshore was between 10 and 30%. So even with labor arbitrage, even from the association that represents offshore providers, there's still as much as a 30% cost savings opportunity. And as Paul has mentioned, clearly the impact on labor is going to be one of the most significant effects of implementing RPA and AI. And the last 10 years was all around securing more labor at lower cost, hence the success of the offshore outsource providers. And the coming decade will undoubtedly be about replacing that labor with RPA and AI. Uh, obviously, as you implement a robot, its ability to uh, replace numerous employees is significant. And we reference in, uh, on our slide an example where uh, 10 software robots can do the work of 20. Um, speaking to some service providers, they're already discussing robots capable of displacing between five, 10 employees. The impact is gonna be very significant. And once the scripts have been designed for robots, the marginal costs of then rolling out additional robots as the demand for services increases should be relatively low. That's subject, obviously, to ensuring that the license fee arrangements that uh, are there aren't penal and prevent you from doing that. There is no doubt that RPA will refine a lot of new roles and require new additional skills and training. And as Paul has indicated, uh, you know, it, it is Google's view that there is only a limited number of people who have currently the requisite skills to be operating successfully in this space. Now, automation, as, as we've mentioned, is going to have a, a big impact on employment and society as a whole. And Switzerland has been at the forefront of the adoption of automated technologies, and it's been driven by a number of factors. Firstly, it has a very high standard of data protection, which means the ability to offshore or nearshore data protection activities has always been very limited. It also has very high labor costs, a high level of education, and lastly, an innovative and progressive mindset. So all those positive factors have meant that the Swiss economy has been at the forefront of adopting automation. However, they're equally aware of the challenges which this is gonna uh, potentially cause. And under Swiss law, if enough, if 100,000 people uh, call for a referendum to be held and you get 100,000 signatures within 18 months, you have a referendum. Well, last week there was a referendum to vote on whether or not they should introduce a basic income uh, law. And that would, be, that would provide that every single adult and every child in Switzerland would be entitled, irrespective of what their actual salaries were, to a basic income of adults, uh, 200, sorry, 2,500 Swiss francs a month and a child 625. I think the exchange rate currently with the US dollar is around one to one. Now the reason that, that the proponents of this particular motion who were calling on everybody support it, their main arguments were all around the impact of automation. That for those who are at the, the lower levels in terms of the workplace, they were the people whose jobs were most likely to be adversely affected. And that for society to function and to be able to create demand for these, these new goods and services which automation are going to be helping to deliver, you need to ensure that people have a basic income. Uh, not surprisingly, it was not passed, the referendum. Uh, 73 voted against. I assume that was those taxpayers who would no doubt be paying for it. But I think what it does show is that it's going to become a very contentious issue going forward. Now, one of the inevitable impacts will be in relation to labor arbitrage. Now, as you know, nearshore and offshore outsourcing has been driven by the ability to offer services using lower cost resources. And that is going to change because, as, as Paul has said, RPA and AI is geographically agnostic. So you can have these robots situated on an onshore location. It, it makes no difference whatsoever. So that over time, we're going to see 
the labor arbitrage opportunity becoming much less relevant. And that is potentially going to threaten the traditional business model <coughs> of outsourcers. And many gl large global providers have bi built their business model around employing more and more people. And to give you a sense of this, the BPO sector is currently estimated to be worth something like $300 billion annually. And in India, there's more than 3 million people working in the BPO sector. Uh, in the Philippines, more than a million. Now, not surprisingly, the outsourcing providers are reacting to the opportunities which RPA and AI uh, offer. And you can see some examples of that. Cognizant acquired Trizetto. Wipro has created an AI platform called Homes. And TCS is working on a platform called Igneo. And Infosys has also made announcements regarding developing automated uh, capabilities. It doesn't really take a large leap of logic to see why implementing software robots makes sound sense. When you think that uh, a robot could cost one-ninth of the cost of a full-time employee in an onshore location like the US or the UK, or a third of the cost of an employee in somewhere like India. I think also the service providers are adopting these opportunities because they see it can offer some very significant commercial benefits. First, for those who are leaders at the vanguard of these developments. They can win new clients. They can retain existing clients by offering them a differentiated solution. It also can contribute to their top line growth because, as Paul mentioned, the cost savings which can be derived from implementing RPA are significant, up to 50 percent. And of course, what that can enable uh, suppliers to do is to vastly increase their margins, particularly where the existing services that they're providing are under sort of legacy type uh, service arrangements and pricing models, which I'll come and talk about a little uh, more in a moment. What it will also enable them to do over time is to reduce the size of their workforce, although their workforce may well be much more skilled than it was previously because the, the less skilled work will be done through RPA automation. Now, we've identified 10 points that we'd like to mention to you in terms of the impact of RPA and AI on your sourcing contracts. So the first relates to your existing uh, contracts. Should you consider restructuring those? Now, as I mentioned, many service providers are already implementing RPA in order to get greater efficiencies. The question is, are customers benefiting from those efficiencies? Not necessarily in terms of the uh, robustness of the environment uh, and the delivery of services, but in terms of costs, because most traditional sourcing contracts will have had commitments entered into by the provider where they will, through the life of the term, commit to efficiencies or cost savings, relatively modest efficiencies or cost savings. KPMG did some uh, research and the the average commitment is around cost saving, I think of around three and a half percent per annum. Now, if they are implementing RPA automation, then suddenly the savings that they can be achieving are very significant. Now, how you get a sensible dialogue with your provider is clearly a key question, and we would encourage you to look at those contracts, your termination for convenience rights, to see what is the cost of uh, potentially moving away, because that may be one of the levers that you're going to have to use to get a share of the upside which they may well be deriving. The second thing or point to make is where you're now going out to, to tender, where you're issuing RFPs for uh, RPA and uh, or including RPA and AI capabilities within your RFP. Now, one of the things that that may force you to do is to look at different providers, people who perhaps you historically would not have looked at. The reason being not all providers are at the vanguard of RPA adoption and finding the right counterparties is going to be absolutely key. One point just to note, it, <clears throat> traditionally contracts were quite often uh, focused on the amount of human capital deployed in terms of delivering the service. So if you have an FTE-based contract currently, a question, what is the incentive upon the supplier to look to implement automation? Probably very little, because if you're simply paying him by the number of people deployed in your environment, you may end up effectively cross-subsidizing other customers of, of that 
uh, service provider. So now you've been through the RFP process that Peter referred to. You've included in your criteria the capabilities of your vendors to come forth with their RPA and AI solutions. Now what do you do? What, what impact does this have on your contracts? You just go along with the contracts you've got today? Well, I think there's some changes you might want to consider. Number one, as you move from one technology to the other, or as you move from a people solution to a people and technology and automation solution, you're going to be restructuring your process. You're going to be changing the way things are done, which makes it likely there will be a transformation. And as there's a transformation, you need to think about a transformation plan and what incentives are you going to have in place to, to, to ensure that that plan follow that, that the uh, uh, sourcing or the conversion occurs in accordance with the plan transformation. Then you have to ask yourself, well, what commitments do I ask for in the contract? Do I want to be able to test the system compared to the old one? Do I want to be able to rely on the outcomes? How certain are you that this outcome is going to be accurate? Do I get to look at the code? And of course, that depends, is there a code to look at? But certain, certainly in the case of, of RPA, there is code, there are scripts. Um, what service levels do I ask for? Before I was asking for a service level based on essentially a human performance with old legacy systems, but now I've got a completely different system. I've got an automated system mimicking human behavior. You have to recalibrate and reconsider and remeasure the activities that you're going to be monitoring from a service level standpoint. Now, the um, fifth point is pricing. When you look at the pricing, the first point, as Peter said, part of the reason you may not be getting the advantage of RPA or AI capabilities under your existing contracts is you don't necessarily have the right to require that suppliers disclose their capabilities in this regard. So number one, you want visibility. You want to make sure you understand both what the service provider is introducing and if they're not introducing it, what capabilities in this area do they have? What are they offering to other customers in, uh, in this area? Then you have to decide who chooses them. Do I get a right to approve it or not? Um, and then finally, you're going to have to think about as you start these contracts with, with RPA capability or even AI, well, how do I judge what the pricing is going to be? Is there going to be a glide path down of pricing? What's the commitment? So that pricing commitment component, which is really the gut of the advantages you're trying to get oftentimes from these capabilities, is going to have to factor that unknown into it. There's not, you know, the holy grail in, a, in sourcing has always been, can we measure success based on the outcomes, things that matter to our business? Well, there, this may get an additional um, uh, push, if you will, with the introduction of RPA and AI, because previously we were always, as I think Brad and Joe mentioned, you're measuring the inputs of data. You're measuring how many servers, how many um, instances, how many FTEs? Well, if you suddenly don't have FTEs or you're not measuring uh, the inputs of servers and instances, what are you left with? And this may be an opportunity to think very carefully about what some outcome-based measures are, if not the sole measure for pricing, maybe an added component for, um, for calculating pricing. Now, the difficulty always has been with outcome-based measures, what do you measure? Um, now, the, the, the next point I want to talk about is the impact of introducing RPA and AI on your compliance with your contracts. Think about this. A number of your existing legacy software contracts, perhaps an SAP contract, measures your authorization to use that based on the number of users. What happened when you, when you introduce one robot to replace four or five or ten users? Is that robot one user? Is it the users that it replaced? Secondly, do you even have the ability to interface software robots or any other software with your existing legacy system? And what impact might this have on your indemnity where indemnities have a common carve out for the indemnity does not apply if there's a combination of the licensor software with any other software that they did not provide? Users would not have been software, but replacing users with AI, robotic software, suddenly introduces a variable that may ex get them out of their indemnity obligations. 
So assume that you have implemented RPA or AI. That does force you to rethink ownership and use rights. So one of the potential vulnerabilities that clients could find themselves in is at the termination uh, of the contract. You know, if, for example, they don't have rights to certain of the intellectual property, be it in the scripts or otherwise, are they going to be able to freely move to another provider or indeed deliver services themselves? So in order to avoid that risk of lock-in with one particular supplier, it's very important to negotiate rights at the end of the contract, which will give you the necessary uh, rights in order to be able to continue to, to benefit from the, the services that previously were uh, provided. Now, are scripts for RPA useful without the best-based software? Well, yes, they are, because the, the scripts will have the rules which capture how the RPA will operate, and those same rules should, although they may need to be rewritten in a script for whatever RPA product is going to be deployed in due course, they should still be valid. Those same rules should apply. So ensuring that you get ownership or rights in respect of those is, is undoubtedly important. Now, one of the issues, that, a current theme, that currently there are only a limited number of people who have the kind of experience in relation to RPA or AI to enable large corporates to truly exploit this opportunity. And one of the things that all corporations need to think very hard about is how are they going to be able to, to do that? Are they going to have the understanding and wherewithal in order to be able to deal with providers? It may well be that you'll end up with consultants offering these particular skills rather like in, in uh, the new digital age that Brad was describing where service integration has become such a key issue, maybe consultants providing particular skills in relation to automation will uh, become very, very important. Now, one of the questions that we're, we're asking, as artificial intelligence software learns and gets smarter, well, who owns that accrued benefit, that additional expertise? It's made particularly difficult, as Paul described, the neural network black box, where you don't actually understand quite how the software is, is dealing with and functioning. Now, if you don't know quite how it's doing that, how can you identify and delineate between what its core capabilities were and what it's learned through working in your environment? Now, I don't think we have answers as to how you address that, but these are issues which are going to have to get thought about as people look to uh, implement RPA and AI in, in due course. And then uh, the, the other thing that one needs to be alive to is the fact that no environment is, is static. It's always evolving. And if you are deploying RPA and AI, undoubtedly your own platforms will alter. And what you need to ensure is that you contract and obtain the rights to require your service provider to adjust the software robot so they can continue to support your environment as it changes. The last point we'd like to highlight, and it's the fact that the implementation of RPA and AI could change some of the structures by which people contract, and in particular, we could see hybrid structures, which have not previously been uh, deployed, becoming much more prevalent. And this, in part, is down to the geographic agnostic nature of RPA and AI technology. So, for example, if there is a customer who needs to be able to control its own data and it's deploying RPA or AI technology, it may well do that within its own environment onshore, but it could then offshore all other services to uh, a service provider. The service provider indeed could be using the RPA AI technology, which is based within the client's environment remotely. So I think one has to recognize that some of the way in which people have contracted in the past, it is going to alter, and some of those changes may throw up other issues. So for example, if you end up having uh, the provider's RPA or AI technology based in your premises, who's responsible for it when it goes down? Because your provider, it's, it's not within his environment, he can't immediately address it. So these are all issues that you're going to have to uh, address. And in particular, it may make it less clear as to where responsibility for issues arising lies. Is it with you or is it with your provider? So 
So in summary, what are the key takeaways that you should take from this? Number one is we believe that RPA, robotics process automation, and artificial intelligence in different degrees are going to have a major transformative effect on how your companies operate and how you purchase services. Um, the impact on outsourcing is enormous. It's going to change the outsourcing world, but all indications are that outsourcing vendors are responding quickly with their own AI solutions. So you'd be able to, they're not going to go away. They're actually going to become your, your RPA and AI solution providers. And from a contract standpoint, you ought to be looking at your existing contracts and evaluating them, considering what capabilities are available to your service providers and in the marketplace. And finally, retool your new contracts. Think about your, how you're going to have to contract in the future to accommodate those 10 items we talked about in terms of the impact on the contract. So that's it. We've got two minutes left. If anybody has any questions, or if anybody's tried the how-old.net yet. <laughs> Big data question. So we as the customer feed data in, voice or, or whatever, the AI software learns from that and could learn a lot. Mm -hmm. What value are we getting out of that? Well, presumably you're the ones getting the benefit. In yeah. other words, Mark, you would not use artificial intelligence systems for someone else's benefit. It, you would you would contract for, say, for example, Watson. But that's just like a model, we, uh, a little bit like a model, mm -hmm. where we feed data in and other, other customers of that supplier feed data in and, and that model uses that data to, um, to provide better uh, results ah, analysis. You're talking about big data where, where there's contribution to big data from multiple customers. Right. And I think that presents a different set of issues, which I, I think were raised in Brad and Joe's discussion about. It, it, it's unique in the AI context because it, it's the software is learning, yes. it's not just creating a new. That, that's exactly right. And there's two elements to it. Certainly you have to protect your data. You have to protect the value that's derived from your data. Um, and I don't have, you know, I think that's key and critical. Um, but if the AI solution depends upon use of your company's data along with other of your competitors' data for providing value to you, I think that's something you have to carefully consider. The alternative is using AI only with your company's data and finding patterns within your company's data. So you have to think very carefully what the proposition is. Is it a data lake combining your other customers' data and yours? Raises a lot of data risks and issues and concerns and value. And are you contributing that to someone else or is it really just being used for your company's enterprise? And I, a very good point. Very good. I don't have a quick answer. Mark? Just an observation. In a way, it's no different from um, the problem that you have at the moment when you outsource to a provider who uses people to learn your business and you have this issue at the end of the contract about what is the extent to which they can keep the know-how that they, these people retained in their heads. It's, 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 it's a bigger issue, but it's not an issue that's completely new, I don't think. Right, right. But it's kind of analogous to when people would put notices of crimes in local newspapers and have that accessible only to people who can go to the archives of that newspaper versus putting it in a large database that people can, re can access years afterwards in geographies far away. I think when you put it into big data um, as opposed to into the minds of individuals, you, you accentuate the problem that you have even in the case of that same sort when people acquire knowledge through experience. But it's a similar, it's in the same thing. We're at zero time on the toll, so thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for your attention.